Welcome back to our series of the Divided Kingdom for the spring semester of 2020. Uh, last week, we're, uh, this week, uh, we're looking at the Southern Kingdom. Uh, we looked at the first three kings of the South. Today we'll start with the fourth king, Jehoshaphat. Uh, see some of the uh, things that he was able to do and some, unfortunately see some of the failures that he had as king as well. But uh, this Divided Kingdom stage here, we see here he's the fourth ruler of the South, uh, ruled from 873 to 848 BC. So 25 years he reigned as king, and for the most part he was a good king. Uh, instructed people in the Word of God. Uh, he realized the importance of who God is. Uh, he trusted God even in the midst of his sin when he joined up with uh, the king of the north, with Ahab, uh, to go into battle. Uh, he wanted to inquire of Jehovah uh, what would happen if they go into battle. And so even when he was not everything that he ought to be, he still recognized the fact that he needed to go to God for instruction here. But like I say, for the most part, he was a good king. He's the uh, second of the good kings of the south. Uh, unfortunately, we find failure in his life as with all the other kings. But he is listed as one of the good. But he does some horrible things here, and that's why we have to be very careful about being consistent in our life with God. Uh, not just some things that we're, we're strong about, but all things that we should be strong about. Uh, he proved the word of God. It says it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other besides the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, there comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria. Behold, they be in Hazen Zom Timor, which is in Gedi. We'll go with in Gedi. It's a lot easier to pronounce. Uh, but here he proves the word of God. Here. He pro proclaims a fast, a national fast. He offered up one of the scriptures, great prayers here in uh, the Bible, in 2 Chronicles 20, 3 through 12. This prayer says, Joseph feared, set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even out of all the cities of Judah, and they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou of the kingdoms of the heathen? In thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Are not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? And they dwelled therein, and built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil come upon us as a sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house, and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. And now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them, we have no might against thee. This great company cometh against us, neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon thee. What a great prayer this is. A prayer of humility here. It says, we don't know what to do, Lord, but we do know this. This land is our land because you gave it to us. You gave it to Abraham. You gave it to us. And that you can take care of the situation. And so they, they proclaim this fast. They proclaim this, this time of prayer. How important it is shows the sovereignty of God, that he trusted God. You know, God deserves to be the ruler of the world. He is sovereign. He is the, the appointed ruler. Therefore, we as his subjects should be, submit ourselves to him. Faithfulness of God. The Lord, you told Abraham that you gave the land to his people. This land is still yours, and you, you've given it to us. The Lord, we ask for help in these times of trouble. A need for and a dependence upon God. 
How important that is. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them, for we have no might against this great company. So we, we're, we can't defeat the enemy. Moab and Ammon, from Mount Seir there down, uh, in Edom, we can't do this, Lord. We need your help. We trust you. We don't know what to do. But you know what? Our eyes are upon you. We believe that you can take care of the situation. And what a great prayer that is. Because it's that heartfelt prayer. The right attitude of the heart. Jehaziel. God's Spirit. Tell me to fall upon Jehaziel. Excuse me. A, a Levite here. And said this. Thus saith the Lord unto you. Be not afraid. Nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours. But God's. What a great verse this has. You know, this battle that we're in in life, the fights that we have in this life, when we're striving, striving to serve God, do what God wants, we need to recognize that the battle is not ours. The battle belongs to God. That we are going to Him out winners in this. If we lose battles here and there, many times that's our fault. Maybe it's God trying to teach us something. But the victory belongs to God. One of the great passages out of the book of Joshua. I, I love Joshua chapter 6, verse 2. Uh, may not quote it exactly. You've heard me say, uh, try to quote this verse before. But it says, God's talking to Joshua. And he said, See, or, or look, I have given into thine hand the king of Jericho, the mighty men of valor, valor in the city. Okay, I'm not getting it exactly, but that, that's the gist of it. God says, Look, I have, a past tense, I have already given you the king, I've given you the city, I've given you all the mighty men, the victory has already been won. And he says that before they go into Jericho. If they said it after the, the battle of Jericho, we'd say, oh, yeah, God did that. But he said it before. God has already given the victory. We need to accept the victory and believe that God's control. God told Jehaziel to tell Jehoshaphat and the children of Judah that God knows what's going on. God says, don't, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Greatly encouraged, Jehoshaphat then prepared for battle. He gets the temple priests, the Levitical priests, uh, the choir together to lead the troops into battle, singing a song of praise. It says, when he consulted with the people, he appointed singers and Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army and said, praise the Lord, for His mercy endureth forever. So we're hearing this battle, the battle cry, is that the battle belongs to God, God is the victor, all we can do is praise God, because He's going to take care of the situation. In our lives, the struggles that go through in our life, we might not see the victory yet, but we can praise God, that God knows exactly what to do, and God is going to take care of these situations for us if we simply trust Him, do what God would have us do. The victory in praise, He said, God, just like He promised, He already told them, so no surprises here in this battle, but He intervened, the enemy, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and Edomites, uh, they all end up being defeated. And Jehoshaphat shows His gratefulness when He orders a special praise service to the Lord. And He names the place uh, Barakah, which means praise. So, Jehoshaphat trusted before the battle. He trusted in the midst of the battle. And he knew the proper thing to do was to praise God after the battle. And even have this place set up, a memorial set up. So that all the generations afterward, when they came to this place, and the, a, a child would ask their parent, where are we at? And they say, we're at Barakah. Well, Barakah means praise. Why is it called praise? Well, son, this is why. Because Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, led the, his army to victory against uh, the Ammonites, against the Edomites, uh, against the Moabites, because God intervened in the situation, took control, and therefore God should be praised for that. The constant memorials in the Old Testament, the rocks that take me out of the Jordan River to set up there uh, at Gilgal, the 12 stones, as a memorial. Uh, Constantly, God gave visuals so the children of Israel would remember to praise Him. The Valley of Shechem, remember Mount Ebal, the Mount of Cursing, Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing, 
Uh, evil was barren. So you look at evil and think, okay, if I do wrong, cursed. Look at Gerizim, had vegetation. If I do right, God's going to bless. Very, very important. Jehoshaphat here and his works for God, we see. <clears throat> his spiritual activities. One of the first things he did, he got rid of the male prostitutes out of the land. Rid the land of, as, as far as he could of, of sin, of open sin. He didn't consult Baal. In other words, he did not trust Baal worship in any way whatsoever. And he removed the high places and groves from Judah. These places that people go to worship Baal or other pagan gods. Uh, Jehoshaphat realized it's not enough just not to go there. We need to get rid of these as well. How important that was for the history of Judah here. Legally, uh, activities as king, who he appointed into position, was judges who depend upon God, godly men who, who would make the right decision based on what God wanted rather than what they wanted. Uh, he delegated authority uh, by had Amariah to preside over the religious matters. See, Jehoshaphat's king. He's not the religious leader. So it's Amariah does that. And then Zebediah to preside over political and legal matters. So here, you know, uh, he made sure that he appointed people who knew what they were doing to fulfill the jobs. Because he knew as a man, he couldn't do it all. As king, he had the authority, he had the power, but he didn't have necessarily the knowledge. So he made sure he appointed people that had the right knowledge to do these things. Militarily, uh, he made peace with the northern kingdom, uh, which is good. Uh, unfortunately, I think this led to some compromise. He built forts and stored storage cities, so had supplies throughout the land of Judah. Had an army of 1.16 million men, so very strong defense. Uh, again, uh, maybe this goes back to Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, when God said not to multiply horses or don't have a strong, uh, trust your military. Uh, while Jehoshaphat is, are not wrong in of themselves, and I can't say what was motivated Jehoshaphat in this large army here. Uh, if he did it because he figured more people we have, the more battles we can win, or if that's just what he did. Uh, he just appointed 1.16 million uh, men. God established his kingdom. And that's really what came down to. That's what mattered. That Jehoshaphat trusted God. That God would, is in control. He knew that he was put there in power by God. So Judah ended up bringing gifts to him. They, they honored him. He was a good man, a good leader. And so the uh, tribes of Benjamin and Judah honored him for that. Uh, great wealth and honor. Even his enemies brought presents. The Philistines honored him with silver. Arabs gave him uh, uh, goats, uh, 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 rams and goats. So they, they knew he was a powerful man. They, they knew that there was something different about this man. But the grief, and this is the sad part. We talk about how godly a king he was, and yes, he was a godly king. Uh, we should remember that more so than the, the bad things, but we have to look at the bad things because of the consequences of those things how it played upon the history of Judah. Compromise with three ungodly kings. Uh, you know, we can't be friends with everybody. And I'm not saying we should be enemies with everybody. But I'm just saying we can't be friends with everybody. We can't because some people don't want to be their friends by compromising. And this is what happened with Jehoshaphat. Uh, militarily, with Ahab. He joined up made an alliance against Syria. Uh, as I mentioned before, when uh, Ahab wanted him to join up with him, and they, he, he does that, and even though he does ask God through Micaiah, uh, the, the uh, imprisoned good prophet of the north, uh, what was going to happen, he still should have never made this compromise in the first place. He suggests the king seek counsel, and this is a story here of Micaiah here. Um, persuade Ahab to allow Micaiah to come out and speak. And remember, uh, Ahab didn't like Micaiah because he always prophesied bad against him, and this prophesy would be bad against him as well. At least he did trust that it, the prophet Jehovah rather than uh, the false prophets who actually predicted the victory against Syria. 
this prophecy here predicted defeat and the death of Ahab. Uh, exactly what happened. A unknown soldier shot an arrow up, ended up uh, uh, hitting him in the back, and he made his way back home to uh, the vineyard, uh, Naboth's vineyard and dying there as, as was predicted by God prophesied by God so did not tell that they didn't prophesy no good concerning me they have said well that's because the truth is the truth no matter what in spite of warning Jehoshaphat uh, still joined up with Ahab almost killed in battle when mistaken for Ahab but God delivered him in spite of Jehoshaphat in spite of all the things he did, God still intervened. God wasn't done with him yet at this point. It came to pass that when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, it's the king of Israel, king of the north. Remember what Ahab did? He knew when going into battle that he was already told by Micaiah that he would die in battle. So he didn't dress up like a king. He dressed up like a regular soldier so he wouldn't be singled out. And allowed Jehoshaphat to be dressed up as the king. And so when the Syrians saw the king, the only one they could think of was Ahab. Therefore they come to him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. So Jehoshaphat was very fortunate in this matter that God protected him. Then it's rebuked by Jehu, uh, the one who would end up killing. Uh, uh, many, many people because God uh, ordered it. Ahab, Jezebel. Uh, Jehab, son of Hananiah the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should thou help the ungodly and love them and hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and have prepared thine heart to see God. So God did say there's some good things, but you're still doing it wrong. You joined up with the enemy. Compromise. He allowed his son, Joram, or Jehoram, J-E-R-O-M, or J-E, well, actually down here. I uh, forgot that right there. So, spelled two different ways, you remember. Uh, but he married, uh, allowed him to marry Athaliah, the, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, the king of, the, of Israel. Uh, should never have happened. Remember, uh, she had a brother also by the name of Jehoram, who became, he became king of the north, Jehoram, king of the north. At the same time, Jehoram, uh, the son of uh, Jehoshaphat, became king of the south. Remember, it's it a little confusing there sometimes. Okay? Try, you know, make sure you're thinking about these things as you go through these. Then the compromise with Ahaziah, uh, another son of Ahab, who built a fleet of trading ships. And so, he joined up. Eliezer predicted God would destroy the ships, and of course that's what, exactly what happened. And then the compromise with Jehoram, the, the king of the north here, is not, obviously not his son Jehoram, but the king of the north, Jehoram, in their alliance against the Moabites. Uh, even though I've already been rebuked for joining up with Ahab, he does it again. End up in the desert with no water. He did seek after God's counsel. And Elisha agreed to help uh, the soldiers for Jehoshaphat's sake. And so water was provided here. Then Jehoram, his son, co-regency with Jehoshaphat, uh, meaning they reigned at the same time. Sometimes when you're looking at these kings, it looks like that their kingdom should have lasted longer here or shorter there. Uh, but sometimes they reigned at the exact same time. Uh, and so for, from 853 to 848, uh, Jehoshaphat was still reigning as well as his son. His wickedness, uh, 32 years old, becomes king, a godless king. Well, he married Athaliah. And apparently he had no problems with marrying Athaliah. And here she is, the wicked daughter of Ahab and Je uh, Jezebel. So it shows his, his standard. Remember the chart here. Ethbel, whose uh, daughter was Jezebel. Uh, Omri, whose son was Ahab. Jezebel and Ahab marries. And they have Ahaziah, Jehoram, and Athaliah. They're three children. 
at the same time in Judah, this is northern kingdom here, in Judah, uh, Asa who begat Jehoshaphat, who had a son Jehoram, who married Athaliah, so these two married, ended up having a son, Ahaziah, the same name as over here, different obviously a different person, king of the north, king of the south. Uh, upon his death, Athaliah becomes upon Ahaziah's death, Athaliah takes over as queen. Uh, thinking then she has went in and wiped out all of her uh, 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 children or his, her husband's children. One saved alive, Joash, actually ended up being saved by Athaliah's sister, uh, Jehoshaphat, who hid Joash so that, uh, uh, not, not Athaliah's sister, but Ahaziah's sister, and, and another child of Jehoram, excuse me, uh, who ended up uh, protecting him. And so, she uh, ended up killing his brothers, built high places, uh, Jehoram did here. Um, it's a mess. Here he has a, a godly father, but his godly father compromised in so many different ways that apparently Jehoram decided to follow the bad things, not the good. Uh, and he had brethren, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehiel, Jezariah, and Azariah, and Michael, and Shephatiah, and all these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. So, uh, just a, a listing there of his brothers. He made high places, place of idol worship. Again, uh, went strictly against what God wanted. Caused Jerusalem, it says back here again, to commit fornication. So sexual sins became very prevalent again. Uh, attacked Edom, hoping to regain control of the land. Escaped the battle, uh, but failed to, in controlling Edom. He did survive it, but he wasn't able to gain the control that he, that they one time before had. His destruction, a letter came from Elijah. Uh, the only writing that we have from Elijah, uh, the only thing that we have that he actually says that he wrote down. But he caused Judah to prostitute themselves, and so God ended up punishing the people and uh, the king as well, Jehoram as well, uh, came writing to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus saith Lord God of David, thy father, because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa the king of Judah, but has walked in the ways of the king of Israel. A sad commentary that he follows after, of course, like I say, his wife, Athaliah, is wicked. Uh, her heritage is wicked. His dad did wickedness. Uh, was a good man who did wickedness. So he followed the wrong examples here. God aroused the hostility of the Philistines and Arabs against him. Uh, God allowed him to have an enemy that he may not have had if he'd followed God. Uh, took all the sons, but Ahaziah, also known Jehoahaz. Elijah predicted that he would have an incurable disease, two years' suffering. Uh, before he finally died from it, and unlamented by the people. Here he gave the people what they wanted, sin. Uh, but when it came time for his death, they didn't care anything about him. Then we'll look at the next king, Ahaziah, uh, as we begin next week. Thank you. We'll see you again later.